Can you tell us a little about your latest novel, Sins of the Younger Sons? Well, it's it's an adventure story, it's a thriller, but I think it, of it primarily as a love story, a likely love story. Uh, yeah. uh, Ex-Marine, he didn't have a very happy experience. He has of Hispanic and Basque heritage. Curious about that. And so one of our many uh, intelligence agencies sent him to penetrate the, the uh, Basque uh, separatist organization. It was called ETA, uh, acronym. Uh, that uh, the violence began in 1968, but it was really goes back centuries, and particularly to the uh, Franco, to the Spanish Civil War, and the Franco uh, dictatorship. They were major losers of that war, and in 1968, some of the young firebrands started fighting back, and it, uh, so my character, uh, Luke Bergoa successfully uh, uh, gets inside, finds a way into connecting uh, with his organization and with its military commander. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Peru Madariaga. And uh, the ruse it's a sting is a, they're trying to set him up for a false arms running thing. But it goes awry when he falls in love with uh, Peru's estranged wife, uh, uh, Iselina, who's uh, not of that, but she's mainly because she's wanted in Spain, mainly because she's married to this terrorist, separatist, uh, revolutionary. But she's living in exile in Paris, mostly, but in France. She can't come back to... Uh, Spain, but she's a, a frustrated academic. She's trying to write uh, a book or a dissertation about an ancestor who was caught up in a, a, a witchcraft frenzy in the early uh, 17th century in the Basque country. And to finish it, essential archives are in Spain. And so Peru decides that this American can get her into Spain safely, and then we'll get rid of the American. But it doesn't turn out that way. So it's sort of, it's a, it's a triangle of, of these three people. And there's a major subplot that I'd, I'd like to say a little bit about too, but we can, uh, but my, it's, it's a love story on the run. So what drew you to the Basque culture, this this piece of history? What what was sort of your introduction and why did well, you write about it? Well, I, I think that uh, the Pyrenees always had this, there was something just seemed magical about that, that uh, uh, mountain range, partly because of the look of it and also that the Spanish and French uh, history and war and met right in the middle of it. But there was this uh, uh, people that lived on both sides, and within and both sides of that border had been in, in, enforced on them. Uh, the oldest culture in Europe, their, their language is the oldest uh, in Europe. And, but when my wife took me, if I, stepdaughter and her best friend on my first trip to Europe in the 1980s. And we went to England and Paris and picked up a car and we turned left, but there was so much going on there. I would like to go and ride. But anyway, it became first of reading interest. Uh, and then I, I found out that I thought that most of the Basques in the United States are the sheep herders out west. And I thought, that's very interesting, but I, can't, I can't, couldn't see a book about that. But then I found out they were really all around us in the southwest. Uh, they come to us filtered through, in our part, uh, largely uh, through, we think, well, they're just other Hispanics. 
but they could come from Cuba or Argentina because they have a tradition of primogeniture in, in which all inheritance goes to the firstborn. Well, if they were on the southern side of the uh, Pyrenees, then they went abroad with the empire as whalers, as soldiers, as priests. And uh, I chanced upon that, uh, and it's like, oh, I, well, I, that's something I think I'd really like to write about. And my wife and I went back in 1988, and uh, uh, it's disappeared there for weeks and weeks on both sides of the border, magical trip. But I came back with a real feel for the terrain and these three characters. And I worked through a draft, got through halfway of a draft, and I thought, I really like this, but I don't have no story. There's not enough story to support it. And that's when I get to the uh, subplot, uh, something very important happened uh, in the early 90s. Uh, the uh, Guggenheim Fellowship at New York wanted to, uh, quote, expand their brand uh, and have a major museum in Europe. And they picked, of all places, Bilbao, Spain. It was the only place we saw in the Basque country in our travels in that was that we wanted to get away from. It was in a post-industrial ruin, and it was just, it was polluted. It was, you know, the shipyards were closed, the steel mills were shut down. It was just like, and it was a real hotbed of the, of the separatists. And I thought then, you know, I'm not sure these Americans know exactly what they're getting into, to put that, to put that there, but they, uh, the, uh, the peaceful Basques in, in Spanish Basque country very much wanted it. They came up with the money, public and private, and uh, just lavished money on the Guggenheim Foundation to to put it there. And they got they attracted the world's most celebrated architect uh, Frank Gehry to to be the uh, uh, architect. And against all odds, it worked. But in that, so Frank Gehry became a fictionalized character. And also, King Juan Carlos of Spain was drawn into it because of the politics. And so that was, that discovery gave me, I thought, okay, that's a, that's a bigger story than I had, than I could, that I can build with, and possibly engaged in an American audience. <laughs> the Europeans have been living with it since 1968. They know about that. But, uh, uh, you know, there was a, a, a bit of a learning process for me, but also trying to uh, uh, convince my readership, such as it is, that it's not all about Texas. Yeah. Even though my protagonists grew up on them ranch in Texas, and there's a fair amount of Texas in it. So, that's... Well, I know you mentioned a couple of trips. How did you go about researching for this book, um, either there or here? Well, I... Uh, I'd read quite a bit uh, before, we, before we went out there. Uh, then I found out that well, one of the Basque languages is impossible for someone like me to learn. It's, if you're not born with it, it's, it's just, uh, it's not a romance language. It seems to have no logic. It's very hard to pronounce. But I also discovered uh, I really need to know more Spanish than I did at the time when we were prowling around there. So uh, I got a tutor that I worked with for several years and uh, just kept just kept, uh, uh, it was set aside for two decades, really. But I, it was always a book I thought I'd like to get back to. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, uh, my, a journalism project took me to South America and to the rainforest of Ecuador. And that became part of the plot by just uh, 
the, uh, the origin of the gun running uh, scheme. So it 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 uh, it was a, a long um, project, uh, and as as was my prior book novel with TCU Press, uh, *A Commander's Sundown*, which is another book I'm very proud of. But when that book, when that novel was finished, then I took on a uh, biography of uh, Ann Richards, and that, was, that took three years. Uh, and then it was in production, it was gone. I really had no reason not to go to my mother's old cedar mm -hmm. chest and pull out that box of paper and say, Is, do I still find something there? I did. So that, that's pretty much the history of it. But uh, uh, I've got the, the, the ground zero of uh, writing about the Basques in the English is uh, University of Nevada, Reno Press, because there are a lot of Basques, and yeah. they're, wow. those are mostly French Basques mm -hmm. out west. But they have this, you know, I've got a long bookshelf and dictionaries, <laughs> and, and so I'm you know, it's partly reading and partly uh, you know, just plunging into it. And, uh. Well, uh, on a lighter note, uh, as a hypothetical question, say that this becomes a movie, who would you cast? <laughs> oh, you know, uh, for, for, for the protagonist, uh, mm -hmm. I really like Chris Pine. Or, mm -hmm. Jeremy Renner, uh, the, for the for, the, for Peru, and yeah. Selena, I could I can see people and I can see actors and movies and say, oh, that would work. Mm -hmm. But I recognize, I recognize faces and roles and faces and roles, mm -hmm. but I almost never remember the name. It takes <laughs> yeah. certain, yeah. It takes many. Uh, you know, I could, uh, if I were ever presented with that opportunity, I could come up with some yeah. names and favorites. But uh, Rachel Wise uh, mm -hmm. would be a wonderful mm -hmm. one for her. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, there are all kinds of uh, great, great characters who can play complicated heavies, who could play Peru. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, I just wanted to ask you one or two more broad questions about being a writer. Um, what, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what inspired you to become a writer? How'd you get started? Well, reading mm. was, uh, you know, uh, but I never thought that I had any possibility of it, but uh, uh, I had a very important mentor in a last semester in graduate school, uh, James Hobart, who mm -hmm. has, you know, he and his wife had great history with DC Press. Mm -hmm. And he was very enc encouraging. And then also, when I was, uh, was in the early 60s, so I was still a schoolboy. I grew up in Wichita Falls, mm -hmm. well, just 18 miles down the road. Larry McMurtry was having all this spectacular success with his with his early books, and uh, I wasn't influenced so much by him and material or style. It was just a uh, realizing that realization that it can be done. So I, you know, with with Jim Harvard's uh, encouragement, I thought, oh, okay, I'm not going to go to law school. I'm not going to be a historian, uh, but I, I can do this. Of course, it was 10 or 12 years before I got anywhere with it, but uh, so that, that, that's, uh, you know, I was a voracious reader from, you know, from childhood on, uh, and at some point, uh, I wanted to be a novelist, and my journalism I became kind of, a, I was an accidental journalist, <laughs> because uh, I was writing pretty well, but wasn't getting published. But then Texas Monthly Magazine came along, and I uh, lucked into the ground floor of that as a freelancer, and that led to you know, yeah. uh, 
half a career in magazine writing and gave me all kinds of material and wonderful experiences, but also uh, then, uh, then the time came when I thought I should be writing books. <laughs> so then I got the opportunity to, but it's come back around now that I get back to where I meant to, which is write, write novels. I wrote a novel uh, in the 80s that uh, had some nice reviews and almost got made into a movie. And I was very proud of it at the time, but then I realized it was a first novel. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I could do better than that if I ever can get to Comanches or the past, mm -hmm. if I can ever get back to I can work on those books. So I'm, I'm, I th I'm very proud of them. I think the, those, the two novels I've done here and a couple of nonfiction books are the best, best that I've done. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that you're also a reader, which I know that usually goes hand in hand with being a writer. Who are some of your favorite novelists or uh, um, authors? I've, I really like, really like the uh, style and ambition of uh, late Robert Stone. Uh, and had the pleasure of getting to be not, not long before he died. Uh, Michael Ondaatje is, of, I'm not never sure quite how to pronounce his Sri Lankan name, but I read everything that he, that he puts out there because it's always... Uh, 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 it's, it's just so ambitious and, and has such wide range and has, has such great style. Uh, the old Dr. Rowe was, uh, was one of my favorites, is one of my favorites. He's been gone for a while, but uh, it's very interesting, even though I'm, my career was mostly nonfiction, I was always writing, always writing fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, re reading fiction, mm -hmm. reading fiction, it's, and it's mostly contemporary. Uh, uh, there's a Bernie A. Do you know that? Do you know that novelist? He's a. I think he's he's British, mm -hmm. but he, he's his books are everywhere. And this is another uh, British writer I admire a lot, named William Boyd. And I, I have uh, you know, a short list of mm -hmm. ones I always look for, and then um, and others that you know, come to my attention. But that's pretty much what I read. Uh, well, what do you, kind of wrap up on this question, what do you enjoy most about the writing process? <laughs> you know, uh, one, one, one thing that, as I said, I've written a lot of nonfiction, not as much fiction, but one thing that the difference in the process is to me is that unlike in nonfiction, when you're writing, you're working in fiction, you've got whether it's a rough idea or an outline, most of it is going back to it every day, just moving the process along. But in fiction, every once in a while things start happening that you didn't know were going to happen. Characters start saying things you didn't know they were going to say. And it just opens up, you know, op opens up all kinds of things. And it's, it's the best feeling that you can, for me, that you can walk away from. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, it doesn't happen or not, but it's, it's really, a, for me, a magical moment when that happens. Uh, and that's, the, those few experiences are what, what have, late in my life and my career have brought me back to what I meant to do at the start of it.